and she came here also very often. Uh, the scripture passage for today is John chapter 10, uh, first a few verses. Uh, very truly, I tell you, anyone who does not enter the sheepfold by the gate, but climbs in by another way, is a thief and a bandit. The one who enters by the gate is the shepherd of the sheep. The gatekeeper opens the gate for him, and the sheep hear his voice. He calls his own sheep by name and leads them out. When he has brought out all of his own, he goes ahead of them, and the sheep follow him because they know his voice. They will not follow a stranger, but they will run from him because they do not know the voice of strangers. Jesus used this figure of speech with them, but they did not understand what he was saying to them. Word of the Lord. Thanks. Thanks. So let's pray. And Lord, we do thank you for uh, the life of Don Grelsma, which he shared with us here. and. We pray for Ethel that you will comfort her and, and uh, give her her connections and her friendships and her network to support her. And we uh, we can uh, we pray that you'll uh, you guide us all as we uh, grow, grow together. Uh, we thank you for our speaker today and uh, pray that you'll guide her and and all of us to grow in grace and knowledge of Jesus Christ. And we pray in His name. Amen. Amen. And Ann White is our speaker today, uh, and she is going to be talking about Luther and the care of persons, Christian. the Christian care of persons. And she said something, she may mention something about the Pope's visit. Uh, I'm looking forward to hearing from you, and thanks for coming and sharing with us. Okay, first of all, if I stand like this and I don't hold the mic, it's fine, right? Mm -hmm. I don't have to focus yeah. it. Uh, second of all, I certainly, and I guess most of us, will miss Don's very thoughtful questions and observations here in Wrestlers. That's a voice that was important and now it's gone. Uh, I'm not intending to mention the Pope. It's not part of my planning, but you all might think about him and the response to him in the context of what I'm going to talk about, Luther and the Christian care of persons. A few months ago, I was reviewing a book about Luther by James Reston, Jr. The book is titled Luther's Fortress, Martin Luther and the Reformation Under Siege. James Reston, Jr. is the very accomplished writer of popular history books. He's written quite a few of them. As I read this book about Luther, the first thought I had was, this writer, Mr. Reston, does not really understand Luther's theology, and he doesn't get the depth, the point of Luther's faith, Luther's biblical faith. He doesn't get this really important thing about Luther. The second thing I thought was, wow, even though he doesn't, he is writing this history book about Luther with considerable understanding and depth and sympathy and enthusiasm. And I liked, you know, and I'm a partisan of Luther. I don't want people dumping on Luther. And I'm reading this book and I'm thinking, this is really quite good the way Reston's attitude towards Luther. And I thought, now why? What, what, what is this? What is the reason for this? contrast, seeming conflict. And I will tell you that the answer to that question came to me in an intuitive burst, which I then confirmed by careful study and examination. My intuitive burst said to me, or my burst of intuition, I guess I should say, said to me that Luther as a pastor, as a shepherd of souls, spoke to James Reston, Jr. across those five centuries. We do not think of Luther in that way. We think of Luther as the leader of the Reformation. We think of him as the man who struggled in the depths of his own soul and with the scripture, and he came up with certain answers, and he wrote, and he taught, and he preached, and he led, and eventually, with all the things that happened, a new church was founded. It was a great reform in the church of which we are the heirs. So we think of him in that way. 
we don't think of him so much as a pastor. But ladies and gentlemen, he was. Above, underneath, around, within, everything that he did partook of his commitment to being a pastor of caring for individual persons. And that is what Reston picked up, even though when Reston was writing and analyzing, he wasn't using religious categories. This is a history book. It's not about religion, so he didn't say he's a pastor. This is what I see when I look, when I analyze what Reston wrote, everything else that I know about Luther. Think about it. Beginning of his public career to the end. That's what he was about. The beginning. The beginning of his public work was the posting of the 95 Theses, right? 1517. In 2017, we're going to celebrate the 500th anniversary of that. And I've suggested both to the Reformed Institute and the pastors here that we might consider focusing on Luther as a pastor. Now think about this 95 Theses. It is true that Luther struggled in the depths of his own soul. It is true that he was an extraordinarily fine biblical scholar and that he studied the Bible. And then he wrote down in the form of theses the conclusions that he had come to. So there is all that, the struggle, <coughs> the thinking, the writing, but why did he act? What was the main, with all of that, I'm not taking away any of the rest of it, because all of the theology, all of the biblical understanding, it's all there, it infuses the pastoral work. But why did he take the step of posting those theses and risking controversy, which came? Because he cared about individual people's souls. Because he cared that his parishioners he wasn't just a scholar, he was a pastor of a church. He cared that his parishioners would be harmed because they would think that either they or their dear relatives could get out of purgatory or hell if they bought an indulgence. Underneath, surrounding, all of it is the pastoral care. The end of his life. I'm just doing a quick beginning to end so you can see the scope of it. The end of his life, the last thing he did. <coughs> Here is Martin Luther, the head of this huge movement. The last thing he did was to travel from Wittenberg to his home county to try to mediate a quarrel between two counts in that county. They'd been quarreling and quarreling, and he was asked to come and to mediate and he said, yes, I will. He had to travel in the winter, and he was sick when he did it. And in the end, he didn't make it back home. He died on that trip. One of the last letters we have that he wrote is a letter along the road to his wife. A pastoral concern, caring about these two leaders, their arguments with each other, and the effects <coughs> that these arguments would have on the little people, caring for individual persons, begin from beginning to end. Now I'd like to consider some other illustrations of this, starting with some of the things that Reston discusses in his book. When he doesn't say this is Luther the pastor, he simply writes about what's going on. Reston's book focuses on, this is why he calls it Luther's Fortress, Luther's time in the Wartburg Castle. This is after the Diet of Worms, when Luther has said, I will not recant any of the books that I've written. He'd already been excommunicated from the church. After the Diet of Worms, he was proclaimed by the Diet an outlaw, which meant he was in danger anywhere he went. So his patron, Duke Frederick of Saxony, arranged for him to go incognito to the Wartburg Castle and stay there for a while so he'd be safe. Because if you were out on the road in public, anyone could cut him down, no problem. So, okay, what is the main task that Luther sets himself while he's in the Wartburg? 
it is to translate the New Testament into German. Okay, what goes into this? Well, what goes into it is, of course, Luther's love of the scriptures, his understanding of the scriptures, the fact that he's a magnificent scholar, he knows the biblical languages, he wants to write an accurate translation, but, and Reston is right about this, he also wants, this is a main goal, he wants his German translation to speak to the hearts and minds of ordinary Germans. Pastoral, isn't it? Speak directly to individual persons, even if they are not intellectually significant. That is a pastoral concern. So I don't have any other examples, but I'll give you the one example that Reston gives in his book. When the angel visits Mary, we're familiar with the translation, Hail Mary, the Lord is with you. In Luther's German, it reads, God greet you, dear Mary. Pastoral concern. Now that's fairly straightforward. That is not complex. But I want to give another example. Again, this is in the book, though Reston doesn't say he's acting as a pastor. I'm saying that. Another example that is more complex. While he was in the Wartburg, Luther wrote a letter to a monk who was about to leave his monastery. In the letter, Luther said, be careful. Maybe you shouldn't do this yet. Okay, now mind you, what's going on here? Luther didn't believe in monasteries. Luther had come to the conclusion that the biblical witness tells us that the Catholic Church's view that monks can become closer to Christ and more like Christ to the way they live, that that simply is not true to the biblical witness. He had been a monk himself, Luther, and he left the monastery. So his main overall theological idea is, never mind monasteries. We don't need monasteries. We don't have the monastic tradition in the Protestant church, right? So what is he doing? Why is he telling this guy, take it easy, be careful. Maybe you don't want to leave yet. Because he worried that for that individual, his decision at that moment, if he acted on it, would create a bad conscience in him. Now you can meditate for quite a while, I think, on the making of decisions. And you may have had experiences like this, where you've lived a certain way for a long time, and it goes very deep within you, and then you decide to do something different, and you think it's right to do it, of course, everything seems right, but no, you do it and you don't feel right, there's something the matter. Luther is going against his own overarching principle about monasteries to say to this guy, for the sake of yourself, take it easy. It may produce, if you do it now, a bad conscience in you. After all, for most people, who knows for all, but for most people going into a monastery, that's a very deeply taken decision. That goes to the heart of what you believe about your faith. So, are you going to all of a sudden, because some guy who's really, really attractive says, no, the hell with monasteries, the individual, the individual person, the care for the individual person, respecting people's consciences. Same thing, same principle. Luther left the Wartburg even while he was still in danger, he wrote Prince Frederick, he was going to leave even Prince Frederick wrote back and said, don't do that, I can't protect you, it's still very dangerous, and Luther said, I don't hold you responsible, I have to do this. Because back in Wittenberg, there were people who were pushing Luther's reformed ideas to the max, so to speak. They were pulling priests out of churches, they were getting rid of paintings and statues because they said, well, Luther taught that the essence of the faith doesn't have to do with any of these material things. And he taught that what priests are in the Catholic Church is wrong. Well, that was true, right? I mean, Luther wasn't going back there to say, what I taught, I'm going back on it, I don't believe it. 
He went back there to Wittenberg in danger, but he made it back. And he preached in his church every day for eight days, telling people again that they had to respect the consciences of other people. That not everyone, not every individual soul was ready to take some of the steps that they were ready to take. I will read you one brief quotation from one of these sermons. Respect the consciences of others. No one can be forced into faith. Biblical religion depends upon each person's being freely persuaded of the truth. He was preaching, look, I, that's why I said it's complex here. He was preaching against his followers and he was protecting the consciences of his opponents. That is care for the individual person. That is being a pastor. He is a theological, biblical leader, but at the same time, he is a pastor, a shepherd. Notice, that's why I had that biblical passage read. Shepherd, notice the trust there. Sheep aren't stupid. Sheep recognize a voice. They will follow the voice of the shepherd that they trust. They will not follow another voice. Luther gained trust because people understood that he cared for them as individuals. Now, it has occurred to me, and we will talk a little more about the present day at the end, I think, but it has occurred to me as I've been meditating on this and working on this and reading that we might be in a different place, who knows? If there had been more voices talking about respecting other people's consciences during our endless debates about gay ordination and gay marriage, I honestly never heard anybody called to do that. It's just, it seemed to me like people on both sides just said their arguments to the other side and back and back and back and back and back. And where was the Let's consider the consciences, how the consciences of others were formed. Okay, now here are scholars. Here, here we go. I'm going to ask you a question. Luther wasn't making this up. What is the almost, I don't know that I'll let you answer because I know you're going, to, you're going to know the answer to this. I want to see who else knows. What is an almost direct biblical parallel to this in the New Testament? Who else did this? It was a different topic, but it's the same thing. Who else was dealing with this and wrote about it? Paul. Thank you. And who can say the situation? The first stone when Jesus said? No, we're talking about Paul here. We're talking about Paul. What was Paul teaching his followers that had to do with respecting people's consciences? I think that's the phrase in one translation of the New Testament, though I can't recall precisely. What, what was it about? Come on. Eating. Oh, I said you couldn't answer, but okay. <laughs> Nobody else knew. The, the rest of you ought to know this. This has to do, I mean, study the Bible for what it has to tell us about our lives. Yes, go, uh, go ahead. Following Jewish law. Well, right, and food, food, constant... Uh, what, cons what, consecrated to idols. Food right. consecrated to idols. I think it's... And it was a Greek uh, thing, not a, not a Jewish thing in that particular case. But there was another right, one right, right. There's a Jewish thing too. But in this case, he says specifically, we don't have to worry about eating anything. It's not, it's not a rule for us. If it's, if it's uh, consecrated to idols, it's fine to eat it. But don't just go doing it and carrying on about it when your brother or your sister has a problem with it, when, there's, when it's a matter of conscience for him or her. Respect that person's conscience. So Luther is following on pretty much directly from that. Okay, now another example from Reston's book, where again he doesn't say pastor, but I'm telling you that's what's going on here. And it has to do with individuals and such a big thing for so many individuals that Luther answers individual questions and counsels them, but then he writes a letter that is published to deal with the question for many individuals. And that is the question of the plague. Bubonic plague, 
Black Death came to Europe in the 14th century, killed between a quarter and a third of Europe's population. Okay, it didn't end with the 14th century. There were outbreaks of the plague in the centuries after that, including in Luther's lifetime and in Wittenberg. There was an outbreak of plague while he was in the Wartburg. People wrote him questions. They asked about this. You know, it's really a bad disease. You understand that? It makes these big purple bulges at your lymph nodes, the buboes. That's why it's called bubonic plague. And it goes to your lungs then. And I read that today the first stage with the buboes can be cured with antibiotics. But once it gets into your lungs, uh, it kills you like that. Even the antibiotics will not act quickly enough. And it's extremely infectious. So people are writing Luther and they're asking him questions. They trust him as their Christian pastor to help them with this. Is it Christian for us to leave Wittenberg, to get out of here, to flee? But may we do this? Is it God's will that we should stay because maybe he wants us to die? And so we should not flee from death. We should be there and welcome death because that's what God wants us to do. How should we as Christians address this terrible situation? So Luther, eventually, having answered individuals, wrote a piece that was published and distributed on whether one may flee from a deadly plague. Now, he said a number of things. It's amazing, the depth and breadth of this piece, but then it's not amazing in the context of what Luther wrote. Um, he said, first of all, that you have to recognize, again, understanding individuals. People's faith is of different strengths. We don't have all the same depth, breadth of faith. Okay. Another thing he said was, it is all right to flee death. There is no biblical command to just stay and wait to die. But then there's the question of, the more complicated question, well, are there people who should stay during a deadly plague? And the answer to that is yes. Number one on the list. Who's going to be number one on the list? Pastors. Exactly. Pastors. pastors. Every Pastors. He mentions pastors. So I get... I don't know if he mentions doctors in particular, but then he also says secular officials. Pastors, secular officials, all have the responsibility for caring for other people. Then he says any other people who have the responsibility of caring for people. Then he says if your neighbor needs help, and appears to have no one else to help them, then you should stay to help your neighbor. He also, Luther is extremely practical, you know, he's enormously spiritual in his understanding, but he's very practical, and he warns people not to fool around with the infectious nature of this thing. I mean, there's fools in every age, and there evidently, you get the impression from his letter that there were people who really ignored the fact that this thing was so infectious and the way they behaved, he warns against that. So here he is, in this way, interpreting Christian biblical ideas of care for the neighbor, helping individual persons to understand and to make their own individual decisions about what to do. Now, once again, as I was thinking about this, there certainly occurred to me pretty quickly an up-to-date example. I don't think that this example is out of date at all. Think of all the fussing about Ebola. Now, my specific example goes back to 1979, which is not that far, and 1979 was the year of Three Mile Island. Near Harrisburg, Pennsylvania, the city where I grew up, Lancaster, Pennsylvania, is 30 miles from Harrisburg. I was living in Washington then, so was my sister Cindy, but our mother still lived in Lancaster, and of course we were quite concerned for her. This is the worst nuclear accident in the history of this country. And the pastor who was in my Lutheran church when I grew up was still the pastor of that Lutheran church. And I learned through the newsletter, which I took, and through talking with my mom, that he was 
getting phone calls day and night from people. Same thing as with Luther. What should we do? Can we leave? Is it responsible for a Christian to leave? People frightened. People with varying degrees of faith, varying abilities to handle this kind of situation. He did the same thing Luther did. He answered the individual questions, but he also wrote something which said essentially, I think, as I recall, the same thing that Luther said, outlining who needed to stay. Of course, he and his wife stayed. Who ought to stay as a matter of Christian responsibility and who could feel no pangs of conscience as Christians if they left during the worst of that period of time when there was the danger of nuclear radiation. So that's a direct, <coughs> direct connection. All right, let me stop for one second before we uh, move on and ask if anyone has any arguments, questions. Everyone, I, I'm making my point so far. Mm -hmm. Comments? Mm -hmm. All right, there's, yes, Howard? The question I asked you many years ago and got a very direct answer, which was how large was that tiny little university? You said seven, Howard, oh, you know the answer. 17 people. And I think in our modern age, we look at Luther or Calvin and say, these guys are just towering above everybody else. But I wish maybe in some future thing when you can talk about this, the cross upon relationship of the face-to-face -face people, how important were they in dialoguing and developing Luther's thought? They're 1515. Oh, okay, but, but your underlying point certainly obtains here because, because you know, Luther large, a big movement, great historical influence, all this kind of stuff, European controversy, assailed from the right Catholics who are criticizing him, people who are more radical Protestants criticizing him, and he, I'll come back to this. Here is Luther caring every single day about individual people as a pastor. Yeah. All right, now I want to move backwards as, uh, as an illustration and for perspective. We've gone back as far as Paul. But of course the model for this is Jesus. And again, for perspective, I want to give two examples. You perhaps will think of others or will go home and look in your Bibles and find others. But I want to give two examples of Jesus doing this in the same way. First example is the rich young ruler. Remember the rich young ruler? No, we don't know. We know the conversation. The one conversation is reported to us. We don't know what Jesus may have known about him. Otherwise, from that conversation, though, you could learn a lot from what the guy said to him. Um, they had the conversation. Luther was able to see deeply, and he cared enough to see deeply into that fellow's mind and heart. This is in Matthew and Mark. Mark says that Jesus loved him. Who wouldn't love him? He was so direct and so straightforward. What must I do to inherit eternal life? He didn't hesitate to say what he had done. And Jesus told him what he needed to do. It was what he, that man, needed to do for the sake of his own soul. Jesus was not making a big moral pronouncement to everyone to give up everything they had. That's not what he was doing. He was speaking to that one God. Now it's sad, the guy didn't do it. The fact that you're a pastor and you're a fine, caring, committed, competent pastor doesn't mean that you will always have the results that you would like to see with individual persons. We know this for sure because I can't remember the passage, but I don't have a sure sense of the guy having failed in the end. He failed. did nothing. The young man, the young man did nothing. Well, you don't, we don't know that. That was my, yeah, that was my question. But, well, we don't know that. The Gospels don't tell us that. They just tell us, I mean, the point is to show us what Jesus is doing mm -hmm. as a pastor to that individual person. My other example, and it's on the same question, the question of money, which Jesus discussed so much in so many ways, again, to an individual. And it's different. This one's Zacchaeus. Now, Maybe Jesus, we, we don't have as much conversation here. Maybe Jesus knew something about Zacchaeus. Zacchaeus certainly knew something about Jesus because he wanted to see him go up in the tree because he was short. And Zacchaeus must have been reasonably well known because we're told he was a tax collector and he was rich. 
So Jesus comes to Jericho and Zacchaeus wants to see him. And it's just so incredibly pastoral. I mean, you can imagine how that man must have felt. The warmth in his heart when Jesus said to him, Zacchaeus, I want to be with you in your house today. Can you imagine that? I mean, what a, what a magnificent thing to say to this guy who's interested in him. And so we don't know what they talked about. We don't know what they said. But we know that it made all the difference in the world to Zacchaeus. Because when it was over, he said he was going to give half of his possessions to the poor. And if he had defrauded any people, he would repay them four times. And Jesus said, today salvation has come to this house. This house to Zacchaeus. He wasn't making a big proclamation to everybody uh, give half of your possessions to the poor, not all the half. That wasn't it at all. It was his care for the person of Zacchaeus. All right, now then, again, this historical perspective. I'm coming back to Luther, but we have to say here, because this is <coughs> important, I, you know, I'm, I'm never teaching history without it having something to do with our lives now. There's no point. Jesus is the model. But I will tell you, because I have read this, that this idea that people who are ministers, who are leaders in preaching and providing the sacraments, who take that role in the Protestant church, we call it vocation, but let's just use vocation overall, who do that as their vocation, from the beginning of the church, from the beginning, through all the centuries down to Luther, being a pastor and caring for individual souls was considered absolutely basic to that vocation. Now, I know this because I have read a very fine book. I found this book when I started working on this topic. By John T. McNeil, a scholar who also wrote a very fine history of Calvinism. He's dead now. He wrote this book called A History of the Cure of Souls. Cure meaning care. It's from the Latin. It was published in 1951. Now, it worries me a little bit. I think it's a little unsettling that that book is out of print. We can talk about it maybe more than it. At any rate, down to Luther. That is what Catholic priests were trained to do. Luther was trained as a Catholic priest. Did I already say, I can't remember, did I say that I suggested to the Reformed Institute and to our pastors here mm -hmm. that they take up, one, one good reason to do it, there are a whole bunch of good reasons that I've already said some, but one good reason is it's ecumenical. I mean, we're not dumping on any Catholics here. Catholic priests did this. Luther was trained as a Catholic priest. Okay, what did Luther add? The Luther and the Reformers broadened it out, opened this idea, to all church members through their doctrine of the priesthood of all believers. But even that, that doesn't mean that every single church member is going to be able to do this or want to do this. And if you do it, you've got to be committed. You've got to have compassion. You've got to know what you're doing. Still, the pastor is the one who does this primarily. It is part of his chosen vocation. And the history of the cure of souls shows that this continued to be true in the church, both Roman Catholic and Protestant, down through the centuries to the time when John McNeil published the book in 1951. Now we can talk a little bit in a little bit about what the situation has been in the more recent years. But that is a major part of church history. It is essential to the Christian vocation of a minister to be a shepherd of souls. I would like to go back to Luther now. I've given examples of how his pastoral care infused his translating and his preaching and his writing of a letter to a whole bunch of people. Now I want to talk give three examples of his pastoral care of individuals. We know something about this because of letters he wrote. Conversations 
How many thousands, hundreds of thousands of conversations? We don't know. They're their lost history. But he wrote letters. 3,000 of his letters extant. We know from allusions in his writings that he wrote more. A very fine scholar, also deceased, Theodore Tappert, took several hundred of these letters, translated them from either the Latin or the German, Luther wrote in both, depending who he was writing for, <coughs> translated them, published them in a book called Luther Letters of Spiritual Counsel. They're arranged in sections, uh, letters to the bereaved and dying, uh, letters to the sick and dying, letters to the bereaved, letters to rulers on matters of state, uh, letters to pastors who, with problems that clergy have, um, the letters on matters of sex and marriage. I've picked out three of these on three different topics as illustrations of how Luther dealt as a pastor with individuals. One of them was written to a guy named Anthony Rudolph. Anthony Rudolph was the father of a student at Wittenberg who'd already done his bachelor's degree, was doing advanced work, had fallen in love, wanted to get married, and wanted his father's consent to his marriage. Luther knew the guy uh, at Wittenberg, the student. He knew the young woman he wanted to marry but the father hadn't given the consent. The young man asked Luther if he could do anything to intercede for him, and Luther did. He wrote a letter to his dad, and in the letter he explained that he thought the marriage was a fine idea in his judgment, that he was quite confident, knowing the young woman and the son, that the son would continue his work who would do very well, and it would be far better for him to be married than to continue in a state where he wanted to get married, and that he had been a very dutiful, good son in not wanting to get married without his father's permission. And he said to Anthony Rudolph, I request that you take a more fatherly attitude toward your son. Okay, that's one example. I want to make a couple generalizations about these examples when I've told you all three of them. Another example different. This letter is, apart from Luther's letters to his wife, this is probably his most famous letter. It's very, very famous. It's to a woman named Barbara Liskirken, who didn't live in Wittenberg. That's why he was writing to her, not talking to her. Her brother had told Luther that she was sorely troubled by the idea of predestination. <laughs> And that she feared, and was very anxious, feared that she was not among the elect. Okay, now I said in passing, and I hope you've been able to see this, that Luther's understanding of the Bible, his theology, and his own faith infused all of his pastoral work. Now watch after that with what he does here. He's not writing sophisticated theological language. He's writing conversationally. But what does he tell this woman? First of all, he tells her that he himself, he understands her concern because he himself has been brought to the brink of death in the past by this kind of worry. Then, and this is a direct quote, and this is a major, major theological point. Such thoughts as yours are a vain searching into the majesty of God and a prying into his secret providence. <laughs> Luther wrote about that in more longer books. There's a hidden God. We, it is not given to us to know everything that's in the mind of God. We can't do it. We know God through Jesus Christ. If we knew everything about God, if we could prove he existed and predict what he's going to think, what he's going to do, if we knew all this, there'd be no need for faith or trust. God wants us to learn to trust. So he says that to her. He explains that. And he does this. This is not a real long letter. Luther didn't write real long letters. But he, he wrote enough so she could understand. Then he says, and this is very sweet how he says it, he says, ask yourself, <coughs> ask yourself, if you please, in which commandment is it written that I should think about and deal with this matter? <laughs> okay? And then he says, 
and again, theological, biblical to the core. The highest of all <coughs> things is that we hold up before our eyes the image of his dear son, our Lord Jesus Christ, every day. Profoundly theological and also very practical. Ask yourself, if you please, in which commandment is it written? What should you meditate on every single day? How should you think? How should you shape your mind? This is solid, practical advice based on profound theological, biblical understanding. <coughs> All right, third example. Different kind of a topic. He wrote to Prince Joachim of Brandenburg, who asked for his counsel before going to war against the Turks, the Muslim Turks. Now, the whole question of theology, predestination, of course that applies to us today, but being at odds with Muslims is also something we're somewhat familiar with. And the Muslim Turks were a serious enemy. They got, on two occasions, I think, to the gates of Vienna in their attempts to invade and take over Central and Western Europe. So this is one effort, this is 1532, when the Emperor Charles is leading an army, and this particular prince has been selected to be the head of the Saxon group that's going to fight. And he's asking if Luther can give him any counsel before he goes off to fight. Once again, it's not a real long letter, but listen to the substance. I'm not reading it all, I'm just telling you some quotations, but the main points. First, Luther says, I pray for all who fight that they will have a courageous spirit that relies on God's help. Second, it gets a little more difficult when you think about what you're going to think and how you're going to pray. That the people going to war not place their reliance on the Turks being altogether wrong while we are innocent and righteous. We too are unrighteous in God's sight. Now, the whole understanding of human sin is contained in that piece of advice to that man about how to think when he's going to war against those Muslims. Finally, I pray that those on our side do not seek honor, glory, land, booty, etc., but only the glory of God and his name together with the defense of poor Christians and subjects. That's profoundly biblical. Now I want to make two brief observations about this. Number one, notice please that in all of these examples, Jesus gives people something to think about. This is not just emoting and saying, oh, I'm so sorry, and I wish you well, and, and I'll pray for you. Praying for you is important, but it's not enough if you really want to help people. He's giving people something to think about. That guy with the son, he may reject Luther's advice, but he has to think, okay, I know who Martin Luther is. This is his judgment. Am I really right to go against it? And in the other two letters, think of the enormously significant ideas and you could take that letter to Barbara Liskirkin and its biblical underpinnings and its theological ideas, one of our small groups could meet and talk about that for weeks on end, I think, because it is so profound. Groups could use it, but it speaks also directly to that woman and her concern. So there's something to think about. Ideas. You can't live the faith without ideas. And second, the second observation I want to make, that is that Luther was a professor, a scholar, the minister of a church in Wittenberg, an author, the leader of a large and controversial movement. But he never said he was too busy to attend to individual persons every day he never said that he should exist and do his work in a specialized part of, I'll use our phraseology, church governance, that he had this leadership, preaching, what have you, gig over here, and the care of persons 
That should be its own separate gate over here. That idea was totally foreign to him, and I ask you to accept on faith. You can go and you can read the book and see if you doubt it. But that has been foreign to the church from the beginning. The idea that somehow the care of persons is some specialty. Now, it may be. It may be that among members of the church, us in the priesthood of all believers, some of us who have special training, special gifts, special knowledge, okay, sure, we're more qualified than others. But the idea that a pastor, that this isn't part of a pastor's work, you can see in Luther, the degree to which he understood that and lived it. So, I think there are many ways in which Luther can be a shepherd to us. And my question is, of course, we're down to the present now, and a book about the cure of souls is, God knows, out of print. I don't know why. What about, do we have, do we have shepherds today? Is that still the understanding of the church today? I will mention the Pope now. I do think that the response to the Pope demonstrates the incredible need for shepherds. The, I'll, I'll, I'll close with the words of Mr. McNeil who wrote the book about the cure of souls. The ultimate needs of individual humans have not changed. Century after century, man has to live with his passions, his conscience, his neighbors, and his God. Okay, what do you think about Luther? What do you think about our situation today? Comments? Arguments? This is scary. Um, Jerry and I had a visit on Thursday from a couple who were in our church uh, 45 years ago um, and before that. Um, that's when we left. They have had nothing but problems since with the ministers who've come there. Uh, this is a small town of 800 people. The congregation had 400 people when we left, and now has 125. Largely because the people who have, the ministries who have come have not understood this at all. They don't even, there's nothing pastoral about what they do. They don't call anybody. They don't visit in anybody's home, which in a small town is important. Nor do they even know the names of the people in the church. Mm -hmm. And I, I, I don't understand what's going on in our seminaries that people are coming out, these are, many of these are younger people, are coming out with this kind of an attitude. <laughs> it boggled my mind. Paul? Yeah, I just want to point something out. Barna uh, pointed out that uh, the typical pastor in church nowadays has about 16 different job descriptions. Okay. Uh, running various committees, meetings, uh, all kinds of uh, strategic planning and management and budgets and uh, all kinds of uh, in infrastructure details and basically a manager and all kinds of other jobs plus weddings, funerals, uh, aunt, pastoring and all these other things and you know Jesus never loaded that load on anybody but we, the church has accumulated those roles over time because nobody else is around to do it, and, and all, all the way down to sweeping the floor in a small church, you know, the so-called pastor is doing all this other stuff, and that no wonder half of them burn out. <coughs> well, I'm not sure that I agree with your historical conclusion about that, that the church has accumulated all these roles. What I wonder is, whether, in, to go back to Mildred's point about the seminaries, what are they teaching the seminaries? What I wonder is has the church gotten away from studying the biblical image of the church and thinking that all these roles you're talking about, I don't, I don't think, I don't think you're going to find them either biblically or in the history of the church, it seems to me that it's more the aping of modern secular organization and lack of confidence in the biblical image of the church 
And I mean, the biblical image is where you start, but I, I wouldn't be working on this if I didn't think that you could learn something from history too. Um, I mean, there's a thing about and the, your your one point. I'm talking partly about the organization and and the way you the way you understand what the church is to be, and that there's something the matter with the understanding. But then there's the thing about the business. And that worries me about individuals because, I mean, Luther was nothing if not busy, for God's sake. But Luther did not think of himself as a chief executive officer. No, he thought pastors, of himself. Too many pastors today think of themselves as chief executive officers. Right, and that is not a biblical image. Right. Yes, I mean, Jesus right. said, I am the good shepherd, and pastors have understood themselves as being shepherds working under Jesus, the chief shepherd, modeling themselves on him. And that is different from being a chief executive. Sam. Well, we had lunch uh, last year with Craig. He introduced the county courses into the mm -hmm. seminary at Princeton now, because I think you made the CEO's wrong title, Jerry, but there are challenges that are beyond just being a pastor. Luxury, I don't think contemporary ministers have. Yeah, but see, you make, it, you make it that it goes beyond being a pastor. As soon as you put it that way, you make the pastor part smaller. You, you minimize it. And sure, accounting. There's all kinds of people that can do accounting. There's all kinds of people that graduate from schools where they learn to do accounting. But what I'm saying is, and this is what I guess the seminaries don't honor. What I'm saying here is Luther understood that doing the shepherding, the care of souls, was a main, main thing. And I will tell you that I think, and I think if you know, you can't prove it historically, it's too big of a thing, but is it possible that part of our church's decline is due to the fact that we don't do that? I mean, that, it's in the nature of human beings. If the church doesn't do it, who the hell is going to do it? Who's going to speak to the deepest spiritual needs of human beings? Why do we have the church? What use is the church? If people in the church do not do that for each other and do not see that as the primary purpose. And yes. may I just interject very, yes. very, you know, very, very briefly for me? Yes. <laughs> A point here. One of the things that I did in, in my ministry in in rural churches was to go places where ministers were not supposed to be. One of those places was the pool room. <laughs> now I went to the pool room because I love to play pool. <laughs> but more more people were turned from their ways in my in time in the pool room to the church than anything else I did in those rural communities. And isn't that what the Pope is trying to tell us? Yeah. It's the exact same thing. Yes. But pastors have to lead in that. How are I'd say I've got a free Roman guy, and I look for people in trouble. And for people who have a form of trouble that I'm somewhat acquainted with, and I hope for the wisdom say, I'm not really the guy to talk to you about this thing. I have my friend who knows about this because I know he's wrestled with it or she has wrestled with it all her life. And I really hope that those kind of informal, that informal kind of network based on people's real spiritual needs is occurring in the congregation all the time on the basis of affinity of passion. Well, you hope that. I've seen it. Sure, sure. And I'm, sure, I'm sure that it happens. Individually, maybe not yes. as a movement, yes. but individually. Yes, individually, individually. But again, there has to be leadership, and there has to be pastoral leadership, and there has to be the kind of pastoral leadership that creates the trust, the understanding that the pastor cares about doing this, is competent to do it, or will see to it that someone who is competent talks to the person. Um, I guess I, I, I will say this, I, this is, besides my love of Luther and my great interest in realizing this thing about Luther as a pastor, 
it goes very deep with me because this pastor that I referred to who, um, who wrote about Three Mile Island, uh, he counseled me in very profound ways and I, over quite a few years. And I think if he hadn't, I'm quite sure I'd have ended up by 40, either a suicide or an alcoholic. And I say that without a shred of exaggeration. And that was pastoral counseling. And he was trained in counseling. He was very competent. But he was a pastor. He cared about me. I was just a girl in the days when people didn't pay much attention to girls. But he cared about individual people in the church. He cared about my parents and my brother and my sister and the other people in the church. But he also had, speaking of the confidence, he also had in Lancaster a relationship with psychiatrists who would see people in the congregation whose emotional problems were more severe than what the pastor could deal with. And they worked very well together in that way. So, I mean, there's just enormous need and enormous possibility here. Um, there's, there, there's an inherent tension, is, and the word, the key word is inherent, inescapable tension between size and intimacy. Yes. And that when we have one or two people gathered together, the dynamic is a very different dynamic than when we gather as a hundred or a thousand. That doesn't take away it in the least from the idea, the basic idea that any pastor worth that name must have care of individuals as a primary responsibility. It does speak to the way in which that responsibility can be carried out. We see it with the Pope who is telling us American people to look at immigrants and children one at a time, the face of the crowd, so to speak. But he, the Pope, has to do this. He can do it symbolically one-on-one. -on -one. He can only do it pastorally sure. Uh, sure, sure, sure. to the world. But that, that's, uh, I'll just say one more thing. I know we have to quit. That's, uh, I mean, the Pope in that sense is an extreme example. I understand what you're saying, but I think it only holds true so far. Uh, number one, somebody said this, and I forget who, but it's extremely profound. Good preaching. You can have hundreds of people in a sanctuary. Good preaching to all that many people. Good preaching divides a crowd into individuals. Mm -hmm. Good preaching speaks to each individual. It gives each person someone something to think about when they go home. And I will say again, if a high school principal, if a high school principal who has a school of a thousand students and enough faculty to teach a thousand students, if that principal can know the names of every student and every teacher in that school and greet them every morning when they come into the school, then I do not see why a pastor of a large church cannot know the names and know something about every individual in that congregation if they care. Okay, thank you for your attention. Thank you, Anne.